So the subject of the discussion tonight is effectively kill off the British free trade virus with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which you've seen our material recently, the press releases and the work that uh, we're doing with Bob Catter and Bob Catter's picked up our idea that we use the Clean Energy Finance Corporation to transform our, our, our physical economy. Now, the little known work and the little known and publicised work of the Hoover Roosevelt Reconstruction Financial Corporation highlights the importance of enabling uh, a retooled clean energy finance corporation to become the primary credit emitting entity for Australia's post corona 19 reconstruction. The CEFC can perform the very same miracles of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in the 1930s and 40s to transform our physical economy in ways that we would deem to be unbelievable. In the period of 1933 to 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt transformed an American economy collapsed by the Depression and a, and a banking system in the United States had fissured apart and led it through a successful economic recovery. And at the time uh, of this in, uh, tense crisis, he actually transformed and shaped the course of history. He saved the American people, the American Republic and civilization. Now, to understand the importance of the uh, Rural Finance Corporation, which I refer to as the RFC and the CEFC and their potentials, I do believe it is, in, it is necessary to understand what ideologies you have to banish, right? Because right now our country has literally been stripped bare by the post-industrial policies of globalisation, economic rationalism, the British free trade and the, whole, the, the wholesale sell-off of you know, our a total Australian industry of manufacturers and infrastructure. And as all Australians today wait patiently in lockdown, it's important to remember that we're in lockdown because we have shut down and partially privatised our entire health care system and our healthcare system has been proven to not be able to meet the needs of our population. So these economic policies that have caused this have been embraced by both sides of politics for at least the last 40 years. That's the Labor and Liberal Party. And what's really good is now that the Australian population can see in this particular time, this particular crisis, that we can't defend ourselves. So we're in, we are going to be in a process of rapid change. And we, as the Citizens Party are in the box seat to guide what this is. The policies um, of the 1930s that, uh, you know, the, the policies we're suffering today are an exact replica of the policies of the 1920s and 1930s that caused the Great Depression in the United States, but also the same policies that propped the enthusiastic support by President Roosevelt and for him to use the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which incidentally was an institution created by a weak president before him, Herbert Hoover, who was completely beholden to the money power, he used the Reconstruction Finance Corporation as a vehicle which, once it was, initial, once it was transformed, because it had to be changed, just like the, the CEFC, um, could emit credit and regrow the US economy. So I want to start with an an introduction which is going to take two, take into account two aspects. So we deal with this question of um, ideology. The first is, I want to ask the question, what is economics? And the second is, what are the important uh, economic lessons of the 1920s that we have to learn from, mainly from the United States? And why are we pointing the United States? The United States, because, you know, Australia never suffered bank failures in the 1920s and in the 1930s as we actually had the Commonwealth Bank acting as a national bank and as a bulwark for the country. It was at its prime right up until 1923 under the leadership of Sir Dennis and Miller. It saved our country from World War I. And King O'Malley, of course, it's found it was still very vocal right up into this particular time. Consequently, we actually did not have the same level of speculation in the economy that the US had, and we had a country rebuilding itself from the ravages of World War I. Now, according to the first World War um, page on the Australian War Memorial website, 
from a population of fewer than 5 million, about 4.9 million to be exact, 416,809 people, sorry, men, enlisted in World War I, of which over 62,000 were killed and 156,000 were wounded, gassed or taken prisoner. We decimated our country by losing an enormous number of the fittest and healthiest men of our nation. And it begs the question, what would our population be today if we hadn't lost so many of these men? So in the first half of the 1920s, in the process in Australia of rebuilding after the war, we were confronted with having to provide for hundreds of thousands of returning troops, and it was quite a daunting effort. Australia did continue its industrialisation policies uh, we had to have for that World War I. But gradually, as the decade rolled on, we ran into problems of oversupply and various other things, mainly you know, financial policies dictated out of the City of London. When it came to the early 1930s, our problem was a collapse of international commodity markets because we'd ridden on the sheep's back right throughout the 1920s and enjoyed really good project, uh, prices for wheat. In the 1930s, we literally fell off the sheep's back and as other commodity prices collapsed, like wheat, which couldn't save us, um, you know, we, we ended up uh, into a vicious deflationary cycle. Now, I'm not going to be focusing Australia, on Australia in the 1920s. Least to say that back then, Ted Theodore, the Treasurer, the Federal Treasurer, had a proposal for direct credit injections. That was £18 million injection of fiduciary note credit into the economy, which means this was credit placed directly into the economy exactly as is happening right now today, right? Now, as the ruling elites around the bank, circles of the Bank of England um, at that particular time, in that particular period of history, only promoted austerity and cutting the budget first, uh, this was in direct, by, the direct confrontation with the, the money managers out of the Bank of England which ran Australia's Commonwealth Bank, unfortunately, in the late 20s and early 30s under Sir Robert Gibson. Now, all of this is another history lesson. It's a good one, which I will work up over time because I think we've got to relive this. It's part of our DNA, so to speak. If you know this, you know how you've got to fight. Right? But let's turn to the first point of what is economics. Roosevelt in 90, 1933, when as president, when he became president, was confronted by, a disaster, by the disaster and the suffering of his people. He at that point made a fundamental change by sweeping away the method of the what we call the British system of economy, which had dominated the earlier 20th century America and caused the Depression. He replaced it with a return to what the US Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton had described as the American system of political economy, with its commitment to nation building and economic development. What he said was that Alexander says the American system of political economy said the commitment of the nation, it represents the commitment of the nation to the principle of, of, uh, of promoting the general welfare through priority on the cognitive development of the citizen. This means the capital intensive, power intensive development of the physical economy, inclusive, inclusive of infrastructure uh, to, to, to produce growth. The sovereign powers of the nation state must be aroused to promote scientific progress and to create the advancement of mankind. Now, many of you may or may not know that we've been associated with Lyndon LaRouche, uh, the world's most foremost physical economist since basically 1989. And in April of 12th, 2003, Lynn was addressing a uh, youth uh, uh, the International LaRouche Youth Movement at that particular time on a series of issues. And he made a very important point that in a real democratic republic, money was to be at the service of the actual physical economy and your general welfare of the population. Uh, and this is an axiom which is fully, virtually not understood by any economist today, and only perhaps by a few government leaders that money is, in fact, as he used to refer to it, was an idiot, and it had to be directed. Unfortunately, that's not been the case. So I want to ask Lyndon LaRouche in the form of Simon Hall to read that particular uh, a, a quote from his address back then in 2003, 17 years ago. Thank you. 
Now, what's the issue? Uh, the issue of money versus economy. Economy should be understood to mean primarily the welfare of the individual member of society. That is the general welfare, both for the present and the future. And also the sovereignty of the nation state of the Republic. This means something that is measured in physical terms. That is in terms of longevity, in terms of healthcare, in terms of physical productivity per capita, in terms of capital improvements in the capacity of society, in land reclamations, improvements and so forth. All physical things which can be measured per capita and per square kilometre. So therefore, the policy of society should be to realise economic objectives which are physical in nature. If we include culture as one of the physical benefits in nature. Therefore, how do we run a money economy in such a way that we achieve physical benefits? We have to put the money system under control of government. We do that in several ways. We do it by national banking, that no debt can be incurred by a nation's government except by its consent. In the US Constitution, that this means that the executive branch can create currency and debt, but it must do so with the consent of Congress. Among nations, we also add another feature, that governments can enter into uh, treaty agreements affecting trade, and these long-term treaty agreements can be used as credit among nations to promote growth among nations, also as well as generating credit from within governments. Now, to come back to home again, our own great former Prime Minister and Treasurer Ben Chifley knew these principles intimately as well. As a member of the 1935 to 1937 Royal Commission into Banking, appointed to inquire into the money and banking systems at the present operation in Australia in the 1930s, he wrote a dissenting minority report which actually recommended the nationalisation of the private banking system as the private banking system would not serve the community. And he said, Banking differs from any other form of business because any action, good or bad, by a banking system affects almost every phase of national life. A banking policy should have one aim, service for the general good of the community. Uh, the making of profit is not necessary to such a policy. This, the mode of uh, actuating those who establish private banks is the making of profit. When bank capital is subscribed or bank shares are bought, what uh, induces the investment to be made is not the rendering of a service to the community, um, uh, but the opinion. Um, uh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, turn the page. But the opinion of the investor that there is a financial advantage in this particular investment over others offering. If the investor were not of that opinion, there would be no private banking. This is not to say that private banks give no consideration to the public interest, but they do so only under the pressure of public opinion, uh, or from motives which bring to them prestige and confidence, and in the long run, profit. If private trading banks are to continue, some limitations should, in my opinion, be placed on the profits which they, in their privileged position of semi-monopolistic public utilities, are able to earn. In times of unhealthy boom conditions, the trading banks are unable individually to check these conditions, and collectively they have never attempted to do so. The fact that they have never even made a collective attempt indicates either a belief that they cannot do so or that the desire for immediate profit during boom periods overrides any consideration of the national interest. The evidence convinces me that the banks, during some years before the depression, encouraged unhealthy economic conditions by unsound advancing. During a depression or feared slump, the banks in their own interests and to protect their depositors on whose confidence the bank's prestige and solvency depend, adopt a policy of contraction which intensifies the evil. 
private banking systems make the community the victim of every wave of optimism or pessimism that surges through the minds of financial speculators. The facts presented before the Commission show clearly that the part played by the trading banks in enabling a measure of recovery from a recent depression to be achieved has been very small. That measure of recovery has been achieved mainly because of action by governments and by the Commonwealth Bank, combined with rising prices for exports. The evidence given before the Commission and personal observation experience lead me to believe that there is no possibility of the objectives for a sound banking system as set out in the general report being reached or of any well-ordered progress being made in the community under a system in which there are privately owned trading banks which have been established for the purpose of making profit. So you can see there that Chifley and the Labor Party, Curtin and these guys had a very clear sense of what they're up against with the private banking system. And so did Roosevelt. So the question becomes, why did, how and why did the Reconstruction Finance Corporation come into existence, right? Why, and this is why Roosevelt had to act finally in 1933, but we're going to go back a bit because in the 1920s in the US, especially from 1925 onwards, there was a, this whole process was marked by incredible speculation and also foreign investment. Policies that were actually driven by Montague Norman the, and the head of the Bank of England in the typical what we call British monetarism mode. He and his lackeys in Wall Street, of course, pushed policies on the people that weren't anywhere near in the same idea of what LaRouche and or Chifley had outlined. And But the thing to remember is that although we hear a lot about Herbert Hoover, the, re the reason the banks had failed was not caused by Herbert Hoover. He was actually a late bunny to the game. Um, and there's that more important people here that you see on the screen. You've got President Calvin Coolidge, then this, this guy in the middle, Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon, and the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, in, in you know, um, who then became, of course, President Hoover at a later period. Now, why haven't you guys necessarily heard much about Coolidge and Mellon? Why haven't they been properly exposed as the architect of the Great Depression? And this is because typically back then the financiers and economists and journalists and, you know, like the Wall Street Journal, journal heartily approved of the British system mix of speculation with, uh, with anti-Labour austerity, right, that these particular guys approved, uh, imposed. Now, a number of the experts of that particular period have even gone as far as to call this period of economic policy by the Coolidge regime a period of, from 1923 to 1929, a period of normalcy, right? This was normal economic policy when it was anything but normal, in fact, crashed the entire US economy, right? They were extremely dangerous policies. Now, born in 1855, this guy, Andrew Mellon, in the middle, he was really the key because mostly presidents are pretty dumb on economic matters, but this guy wasn't. He knew exactly what he was doing. His Andrew Mellon uh, made all his money from his father to Judge Thomas Mellon, who specialised in forcing people into bankruptcy and then foreclosing on his farms. And he then produced a real estate empire and then soon the Mellon Holdings included Mellon Bank Alcoa Aluminium that we've heard of, Gulf Oil, Carborundum and a host of other countries, co companies. The Wall Street installed, had installed Andrew Mellon as President Warren Harding's Treasury Secretary in 1921. Mellon stayed on that post for, you know, President Coolidge and then for President Herbert Hoover until February of 1932. For 11 years, he dictated the financial policies of the United States that caused the Depression. He was born in 72, 1872 in Vermont, and Calvin Coolidge, he, uh, you know, uh, he was uh, a second, uh, born in, in 1972, Calvin Coolidge, you know, it was the second cousin of the Boston Coolidge family, which made it fortune in trading opium in China, right? He, he moved to Massachusetts and became the enforcer of what's called enforcer of what's called the Boston Brahmin Financial Policies, which found its good home in Wall Street. In 1918, Dwight Morrow, the powerful J.P. Morgan banker at the time, who was college, Coolidge's college classmate, helped bankroll Kelvin Coolidge into the Massachusetts governorship. And in 1920, Morrow helped 
secure for Coolidge the post of Vice President under then uh, President Warren Harding. When Harding died under suspicious circumstances in 23, Coolidge vaulted into the presidency. Now, the Mellon Coolidge policy featured reduced standards of, for labour, organised labour, immiseration of fam, farms, fanatical budget balancing, tax cuts for Wall Street controlled businesses, and unchecked financial speculation. During the 1920s, in several key regions, agriculture and the farm economy were just devastated for more than a decade. Yet, you know, Coolidge refused to lift a finger to take measures that would halt the farm crisis, citing the classic doctrine which we get today called laissez-faire, or abstention by governments from interfering in the workings of the free market. There's no place in government for banking, as Joe Hockey famously said, you know, just prior to the global financial crisis we had down here. Solutions were ignored, even though proposals involving parity pricing for farming or the cost of production for the producing of goods, cost of production pricing were being made in, in, in Congress. They weren't interested. Um, uh, in the Mellon Coolidge policy, environment labour, which was not well organised, was literally crushed. In the 1928 report that received little attention at the time, the Brookings Institute found that 60% of American families had less than $2,000 annual income, and that's the income that Brookings defined as necessary for a family to supply itself with the necessities of life. That was actually the reality of Coolidge prosperity. They forced, that Coolidge and Mellon forced a $3 billion limit on annual government US spend expenditures so that the United States would not run a budget, so that so the United States would run a budget surplus and then use that money to pay down the outstanding federal debt. They refused expenditures for any new items of federal in the federal budget and federal infrastructure building was cut to the bone. They fostered a policy geometry of speculation in 1924 to 1926 a nasty Florida real estate boom sucked in money from around the country before it popped. On the stock market a speculator could borrow between 75% and 90% of, of the purchase price of stock through what was called broker loans. Right? These are the modern form of derivatives or the, the ancient form of derivatives I should say. The rise in stock uh, speculation had more and more people playing the market with broker loans. Now, in 1925, these loans totaled $1.5 billion, which is $21 billion today, and you can see how they grew, right? That in 1928, they'd grown up to $5.8 billion and shot up to nearly $80 billion in equivalent terms today by the end of the year. Now, by this point, stock prices were rising every week on the stock market, and money was being sucked uh, into the US markets from around the world. Coolidge, of course, was asked on the 6th of January, 1929, what would he do about the stock market bubble? And he answered nonsensically after consulting with Treasury, I haven't had any indications that the amount of broker loans was large enough to cause particularly unfavorable comment. The next day, of course, in response to Coolidge's comments, the stock markets enjoyed their second highest turnover in history. On March the 3rd, the day after, the day before he left office, Coolidge told the press release, uh, told the press in a release, stock prices are cheap. After four years of systemic speculative build-up, the stock market was over, overvalued by a factor of three to four times. The banks had lent a very large amount into the stock market. But in 1929, the Coolidge Mellon bubble burst on the head of President Hoover had only been in office for about seven months. The large volume of speculative broker loans blew out with the market bubble causing major problems for the overexposed banks. And of course, other speculative markets were, in, uh, were punctured, such as those in the real estate, uh, further sectors of the phys US physical economy, which have been having difficulty uh, since 1929, before the October market crash of 1929, all, all had trouble paying back their bank loans because the economy was crashed, particularly in agriculture. Now, in total, 341 US commercial banks failed in 1929, and more than 1,350 failed in 1930. 
Now, while this is only a relatively small amount of the overall US commercial banks, about 4%, it didn't really constitute the banking crisis that was about to come. Now, Mellon's national reputation collapsed following the crash of 1929 and the onset of the Depression. I mean, the point is that Mellon, the architect of this disaster in the United States, his national reputation collapsed following the, uh, the stock market crash of 1929 and the onset of the Great Depression. And although Mellon particip participated in various effects, uh, efforts in the uh, Hoover administration to revive the economy and maintain the international economic order, he opposed every direct government intervention into the economy. He continued to demand budget cuts. He continued to forbid uh, public works and infrastructure building. As a result, he literally drove the economy onto the rocks. Now, Hoover, who lacked any positive ideas of what to do, uh, nonetheless knew that he had to get himself out of this Mellon in prose straitjacket. It wasn't working. Fortunately, Congress began impeachment proceedings against Mellon in early 1932, so Hoover shifted Mellon to the position of the United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom, useful place for the guy to go, a position he took up in February of 1932. But by then, particularly after the September 1931 crash, maximum damage had been done. Now, the September 1931 crash was caused uh, by effectively uh, England deciding to go off the gold standard because it was finding itself in a precarious position with the value of the pound. Now, the gold standard is where a currency, a country's currency or paper money is has a value directly linked to gold. So they basically took the value of the pound off the gold. This meant that a lot of central banks holding the British pound were immediately confronted with the fact that the pound was actually worthless. It wasn't backed by gold anymore, particularly you know British gold. So instead of selling off the, selling off the pound and creating problems for themselves, many foreign institutions simply began dumping their American securities and buying up US gold. And during a six week period after Britain's September 1931 decision, 15% of all US gold was loaded onto ships and sent overseas, which was completely unprecedented. This led to waves of selling of, of, of US stocks and bonds and other securities. And the prices tumbled to such low levels that the investment and collateral portfolios of banks, insurance companies, and other institutions that handle investments on behalf of other people like railroads, and this, remember this is on top of already suffering the 1929 collapses, these values, these prices dwindled to a point of insolvency and bankruptcy. And then in September uh, 1931, in one month, a record 450 US banks failed and thereafter, the banking, uh, the banking uh, crisis snowballed. Between 1930 and 1932, with most of the failures coming after September 1931, a total of 5,096 banks, commercial banks failed, or more than one in every five banks nationwide. Hundreds of thousands of families lost their life savings and were left penniless. So between, if you have a look at the entire period, the 11 year period from January 1921 to September 30th of 1932, more than 10,000 US banks went out of existence. Many of these crashes, bank crashes were because of poor management. Others didn't have the capital to survive local squalls such as low crop prices but more and more people did not trust the banks. The first attempt to deal with this catastrophe was done about a month later, uh, sorry, two weeks later on the 13th of October, 1931, when Hoover called a group of bankers to the White House to form the National Credit Corporation, which started operations on the 11th of November, 1931. Some of the stronger banks pulled together a pool of about $500 million voluntarily, for the purposes of making loans to the weakened banks, uh, providing those weakened banks would uh, allow them to uh, have some sort of security, so decent security. But the banks themselves 
that were involved in this were really not very keen about lending to banks in trouble. And as they required uh, and, and did really require these debtor banks to pledge their best assets as collateral. It only worked for a few weeks because the germ of the disaster continued to spread because people didn't trust the banks. In fact, in fact, banks didn't trust the banks. Not all banks, however, were in trouble because the Federal Reserve System had been established in 1913 to, to address the problem of periodic banking crisis by becoming the lender of last resort. But this was ineffective in dealing with a continent-wide crisis in the banks because whilst nationally chartered banks were required to become part of this Federal Reserve System, most state chartered and small banks in rural communities chose not to. So during these crises, these state and local banks were unable to seek assistance from the Federal Reserve and the Fed felt no obligation to these banks as they were no longer members. So a large number of these non-Fed affiliated banks in the United States were left to fend for themselves. The panic was continuing. The solution wasn't working. So in December 1931, Eugene Meyer, who was a governor of the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve System, convinced Hoover that a public institution was required. So on December the 7th, 1931, a bill was introduced into the Congress to establish the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. The legislation was approved on by Congress on the January the 22nd, 1932, and the RFC opened for business on February the 2nd, 1932. But under Hoover, the RFC was effectively crippled to be a tool of the private Wall Street banking cabal. cabal, cabal. Uh, the RFC's first chairman, the same Eugene Meyer, who apart from also being the governor of the Federal Reserve Board, was also president of the Lazard Ferrez private Wall Street investment bank. Now, Lazard Ferrez, would later boast members such as our own Paul Keating. Essentially, all the RSC could do was loan money to troubled banks and railroads, which were tightly connected to the banks, in an effort to try and bail out their banking system, but without challenging any of the underlying British free trade policies of the British banking system. The fact that Meyer would suggest the formation of the RSC makes complete sense because here we go again with the private banks wanting to tap into the public purse to bail themselves out. Lazard Ferez was not an American bank, but does have branches in 40 cities and 25 countries around the world. It is actually an instrument of the financial oligarchy, which considers itself superior than, uh, to nations. Now, we've, we've studied and written a lot about these types of banking institutions about it as part of our work on the Sinecki and Steve Burke and dust off his Red New Citizen, New Sinecki newspaper, because that publication is absolutely incredible when you go back and read this history. Lazard specialised from his beginnings in the 1890 gold rush in San Francisco in shaping the world behind the scenes to build up fascism as a counter to the principles and founding ideals in the United States. And it's been a significant agent helping to uh, subvert the United States within, from within, to make sure the United States was not to become a productive industrial society, but instead a consumerist and speculative society. So isn't it not lawful that Paul Keating would be involved? So the RFC's mission was essentially at that time to be very limited, bail out the banks and railroads. Now, as the private banks had already failed in their previous approaches to deal with the crisis, this RFC was now capitalised through public money through the United States Treasury and the Treasury provided $500 million of capital to the RFC, and the RFC was authorised to extend that credit up to uh, $1.5 billion, and there was a subsequently uh, extended to $3 billion. The entire US budget in 1932, incidentally, was only $4.66 billion, $4.66 billion. So you can see how much power the RFC had to try and deal with this banking crisis. Now, the RFC raised the capital by issuing its own debentures, a form of, which is a form of bond, and most of these bonds were bought by the Treasury, um, and the ability to issue deb uh, you know, these debentures over the life of the RFC, not just during this period, but right throughout the period, was, was increased phenomenally over time. Now, under Hoover in 1932, 
uh, the RFC dispensed $1.6 billion to the banks uh, to try and stabilise the banking system, but this did not really produce any improvement either in, bank, in the banking system or the economy. Bank failures continued as hoarding of cash from what were previous uh, bank uh, deposits actually accelerated in early from, from early 1932. Now, Jesse Jones, who was the chairman of the RFC from about June of 1933, appointed by Roosevelt, but was working with the Rural, Rural Finance Corporation, uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, recounts the story of what he was told by a guy by the name of John Slacks, who became the president of the Rural Finance Corporation's mortgage company, which I'll go into later, to illustrate the hoarding problems which saw the bank deposits drop dramatically in this period as people feared losing their savings as such they pulled their money out of the system. By his account, he recalled, recalled the story that one of the surviving banks in South Dakota during this period had foreclosed on a large farm and advertised it for sale for $12,000. A man and wife who had read the advertisement went to the bank and had the banker take them out to the farm. They said that would buy it for $12,000 and make the settlement in a few days. Two days later, they showed up at the bank with a large tin can filled with money and handed it to the banker. When he'd counted the money, the banker said, there's only $10,000 here. The man looked at his wife in, puzz in puzzlement and said, Mama, you can't, that can't be right. You count it. She did and said, that's right, there's only $10,000 here. With a look of disgust, the husband remarked, well, Mama, I guess you brought the wrong can. So even... Now, that was the nature of the population. They were literally hoarding that sort of money. But it wasn't just the population. Even the bankers began to hoard as well. They called in loans and declined to make new loans at that time. They effectively run for shelter, strangling the lifeblood of commerce and industry, just like Ben Chifley said earlier. Now, it took about six months for the sorry situation in early 1932 to change a bit for the better, so around 1932, partly because of the swelling streams of money, the $1.6 billion poured into it by the RFC and you know, into the banks, insurance companies, mortgage, mortgage loan companies, building and loan associations, railroads, and the pockets of a million or so farmers, some of whom have got out their shotguns to prevent foreclosure sales. Uh, but this particular um, you know, growth, this uh, turnaround did not happen, didn't, didn't last long. By September, farm price, September 1932, farm prices and securities started to slide again, and shortly thereafter, more and more smaller banks began to fail. Jesse Jones reported, we heard about hundreds of banks burning in our small towns where their dying embers were ignored. We heard them about them day and night. Many times we saved a bank between midnight and its opening of its doors at 9 a.m. Jones said that by August 25, 1932, we had approved loans aggregating $1.33 billion to 5,520 financial institutions. Of these, 5,865 were banks and trust companies. We helped to reorganise and liquidate 30, 386 other banks which had either sunk or gone under. But despite all these efforts, as one situation was approved, several others got worse and it became apparent to us that loans issuing loans to bank bankrupt banks were not an adequate med medicine to fight the epidemic what the ailing banks needed was a stronger capital structure now a lot of the banks also resisted getting support from the rfc because in july 17th 1932 after some controversial loans were made and namely the Dawes loan, which was a loan made to the former president of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, General Dawes, the Congress passed a bill to amend the Act, the RFC Act, requiring that all loans made by the RFC be reported to the President of the United States, the Senate and the House of Representatives. This, in effect, meant that the loans made by the RFC were publicised and therefore many banks were reluctant to be seen to be as being bailed out by the RFC. And in fact, many banks could have weathered the storm with RFC loans, but this publicity saw them go under with their depositors' funds. Now, as I said before, in this early period, saving the railroads was, was very, very crucial because this, uh, this was part of the economy 
that employed a lot of people but also had a lot of money tied up in it directly tied back to the banks. Now, during the 1930s, there was 250,000 miles of railroad in the United States, of which one third went into receivership or bankruptcy, and another third would have without the intervention of the RFC. The, uh, and the way it worked was that if the Interstate Commerce Commission certified that a company running a railroad was salvageable, then uh, then then the RFC could step in and help it with loans, and the lo and the RFC loaned one billion dollars into the railroads and created tens of thousands of jobs in in the, in, in trying times of unemployment and frequent layoffs. Now, railway bonds were very were a very very important financial security for insurance companies, savings banks, and other investment bodies that serve the public. So, save the railways, the railroads, you, you save the people. And the railroads collectively had the largest industry in the country. In 1932, they normally they not they, they normally employed 1.5 million people. Now the RFC also had enormous power to determine the appropriateness of things like your salaries paid by any corporation borrowing from it. Now President Roosevelt in 1933 wanted to slash the salaries of railroad executives, and in May of 1933. In, an example of some of the loans given to the uh, railroads, the executives from the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, were in the RFC headquarters awaiting word on their loan um, that they desperately needed. At this particular time, Hale Holden, the chairman of the Southern Pacific, had the highest annual salary salary of any rail executive in the country at 150,000 US dollars. Paul Shoup, the vice president, and Agnes MacDonald, the president, uh, of that railroad drew 100,000 and 85,000 uh, US dollars respectively. Now, using the authority that Congress had uh, nearly passed in 1933, uh, Roosevelt proposed slashing Holden salary to just a mere 25,000, but Jones actually cut it to 60,000, and Soups and uh, Shoops and uh, McDonald's salaries were trimmed from you know, 100,000 to 50,000 and 85,000 to 42,000 respectively. Uh, South Pacific got the loan. But Jones did say these particular executives on that day were having bad dreams about our carving knife on executive salaries, but their faces broke into smiles with obvious relief on the news that they weren't going to be getting a lot less. Uh, it was not necessary that I was I had to discuss what I decided with the president, but I did keep him well posted um, all the time as I could. Uh, which, of course, allowed for better cooperation. And he publicised this a few days later on May 28th, that any loans from the Rural Finance, Reconstruction Finance Corporation are going to be subject to salary um, write-downs. Another example of the power that the RFC had um, was not written down, but Jesse Jones frowned on this idea that fat cat railroad owners and CEOs could live in, Lee, in New York um, when their railroads were on the other side of the country. He said that the place for a man uh, running a railroad should be on the railway line uh, because effectively what had happened, living in New York was more of an arrangement to be close to their bankers than actually their operations. Uh, needless to say, he was very successful in getting owners to move to where their operations were. So that was some of the main activity the railroads and the banks prior to the transformation of the RFC with Roosevelt. Because during December and Jan uh, sorry, January and February of 1933, the crisis really did reach fever, fit, fever pitch. To stop bank runs, the uh, state's governors announced a policy that really wasn't a solution, which was bank holidays. Under a bank holiday, banks that were still solvent could stop transacting business or put very strict limits on the amount of money a, government, a customer could withdraw. Financial transactions, however, for commerce and everything in America were being choked off. Effectively, the financial system had collapsed and was on life support. And the people of America were terrified, something I think we've seen a little bit of with the COVID-19 virus here in the Australian population. Now... On March the 3rd, 1933, one day before Roosevelt took office as the new president after a landslide victory, 
Bank holidays had been declared in 46 of the 48 US states. On March the 4th, Roosevelt's inauguration day, the governors of New York and Illinois, the states with the largest commercial banks in the country, also declared bank holidays. In parallel, the New York Stock Exchange, Kansas City Board of Trade, Chicago Board of Trade, and all the other stock and commodity changes were closed, and this was the first time that the Chicago Board of Trade had closed since 1848. And I want to play to you for five minutes just uh, uh, Roosevelt's inaugural address, um, just five minutes of it, because it gives you a sense of what he was dealing with, the sense of fear within the population. President Hoover, Mr. Chief Justice, my friends, this is a day of national consecration. And I am certain that on this day, my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. And I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. In such a spirit on my part and on yours, we face our common difficulties. They concern, thank God, only material things. Values of front to fantastic levels, taxes have risen, our ability to pay has fallen, government of all kinds is faced by serious curtailment of income, the means of exchange are frozen in the currents of trade. The withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no market for their produce, and the savings of many years and thousands of families are gone. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence, and an equally great number toil with little return. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. And yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of locusts. Compared with the perils which our forefathers conquered, because they believed and were not afraid, we have still much to be thankful for. Nature still offers her bounty, and human efforts have multiplied it. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and have abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. True, they have tried, but their efforts have been cast in the pattern of an outworn tradition. Faced by failure of credit, they have proposed only the lending of more money. Stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow their false leadership, they have resorted to exhortations 
pleading carefully for its broad confidence. They only know the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision. And when there is no vision, the people perish. Yes, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truth. I am prepared under my constitutional duty to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. These measures or such other measures as the Congress may fill out of its experience and wisdom, I shall seek within my constitutional authority to bring to speedy adoption. But in the event that the Congress shall fail to take one of these two clauses, in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. So at that point, he got straight into it straight away. He was intervening in a financial system that was, which had collapsed, and in parallel fashion, a physical economy that had completely broken down as well. Because between 1929 and 1933, just that period of four years, US industrial production had tumbled by something between 37 and 54 percent, depending on the data used. At the start of 1933, steel production operated at a mere 24 percent of its 1929 capacity. It's only four years, remember. Between 29, 1929 and 1933, US farm input in constant dollars had fallen nearly half by 45%. Officially, 12.83 million workers were unemployed in January of 1933, constituting 25% of the labor force, but the actual rate was a lot higher. So on the second day, on the second day of his uh, day in office, March the 5th, he, uh, Roosevelt uh, used an executive order under the provisions of the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 to declare a national bank holiday, which superseded all the separate uh, individual bank holidays and closed indefinitely all the banks in the United States beginning March the 6th. The order also gave the Secretary of the Treasury control over all transactions in gold and for foreign exchange. But Roosevelt had to move quickly. By the wee hours of March the 9th, banking legislation had been worked out. It was called the Emergency Banking Act. And the Reconstruction Finance Corporation would now be able to purchase preferred shares, that is stock in banks, and capital notes of troubled banks. In other words, we're no longer dealing in lending loans, but they could actually recapitalize the troubled banks without adding to their debts. Now, this is process of putting capital in the banks prevented the failure of the entire U.S. credit system. And it was out, actually carried out without loss to the government or taxpayer. On the contrary, it actually provided a healthy profit through interest and dividends from March 1933 to March 1948 of over $205 million, which actually covered the cost of the Reconstruction Financial Corporation. Now, the way this would work was well, that the Act, this Emergency Banking Act, established three classification of banks for action. Category A, banks with that were sound and could open under their own power. Category B, banks whose capital had disappeared but with ass, which, which had assets considered, considered sufficient enough to pay depositors in full and would require, uh, but, but would require an RFC capital infusion. And then Category C, banks, banks whose capital was completely gone and there was an indicated potential loss to the, the, the depositors. The conservator, uh, which was, a, which was uh, appointed under the con control of currency, would then step in to either reorganize or liquidate these banks. At noon on March the 9th, President Roosevelt sent a message to Congress. 
I cannot too strongly urge upon the Congress the clear necessity for immediate action on the Emergency Banking Act. The House of Representatives voted unanimously for the Act, and then the Senate by 73 to 7. A few senators argued it would strengthen the role of the New York banks. The Senate adjourned at 7.52 uh, p.m. Roosevelt signed it into law at 8.37. The whole affair from the first introduction to the final signature had taken eight hours. On Sunday night, three days later, on March the 12th, Roosevelt delivered his first radio fireside chat to an estimated 60 million Americans, half the population in the United States, on the banking situation, including that some of our bankers had used the money entrusted to them in speculations, is what he said. He told them what the Banking Act contained and promised the reopening of the banks next morning, March the 13th. Banks had been closed for the entire week since March the 6th. Category A banks reopened immediately with extra supply with supplies of fresh cash if needed. B category B banks were opened as quickly as they could as they got into shape, and and C banks remained closed pending reorganization or liquidation. Nothing so demonstrates <clears throat> the tremendous confidence that Roosevelt transmitted to the population on this and that on this and subsequent days for March the 13th, Americans put more money into the banks than they took out. By March the 15th, some 70% of the nearly 18,400 banks or 12,900 nationally chartered banks that had been in existence unsound or un, you know, sound or unsound prior to March the 3rd had reopened without RFC assistance and 76% was still operating by April the 12th. So the confidence came back into the banking system. So a lot of these banks didn't require RFC assistance, but a lot did. During the course of 1933, the uh, Comptroller of Currency appointed uh, conservators and liquidated 1,100 banks as insolvent and a lot more would have collapsed without Roosevelt's actions. Another 3,115 nationally chartered banks remained troubled and closed, but not insolvent. Many of these RFC banks uh, banks required RFC assistance, but they wouldn't come forward to, to seek it. Uh, moreover, a few months after the banks had reopened, uh, you know, Jones discovered that several thousand of them, including some of the several largest ones, actually had serious problems, but would not come forward to get assistance, and if they didn't, they would fail. Um, all the while, of course, you had the syndicate operation, this, this operation that was you know, highlighted by the likes of um, uh, Morgan, Mellon, DuPont, the, the private banking alliances of Wall Street attacked the revamped RFC as being socialist, and they discouraged the bank from seeking assistance. And the issue really did come to a head uh, at uh, on the 5th of September 1933 at an American Bankers Association annual con convention in Chicago, where Jones was one of the featured speakers. He, he was actually told by the bankers, now, just, just, just be smart for once, will you? After his speech, not a single person applauded his remarks. The next speaker, the Federal Reserve Board member Eugene Blank, Black, spent a good period, period part of his uh, speech apologising for Jones' actual address and speech. Later on that evening at the convention dinner, as you have with these things, although reluctant to speak again, the crowd of bankers insisted that he did. Jones said, I made one speech today and you did not like it. Now I suppose I ought to say something to redeem myself in your eyes. What I say here is, is being said at a private dinner as an, and is entirely off the record. And if there's any newspaper uh, men here, they will treat it so. He then went on to say, half the banks represented in this room are insolvent, and those of you representing these banks know it better than anyone else. That was his speech, and then he sat down and there was dead silence. But the logjam was broken. On, in October, directly after that, Henry D. Gibson, the president of the Large Manufacturers Trust Bank of New York, accompanied by the bank's attorneys, visited Jones in Washington. Gibson told Jones that the bank was desperate, that it needed desperately 25 million US in capital. Jones provided it, and from that, the dam wall was broken and other banks followed suit. That blast started, that black blast at the Bankers Conference started a rush on the preferred stock program. 
Jones said that they often processed and authorized the purchase of, of capital in as much as 100 banks a day. But the job wasn't done in some haphazard manner. To help the regular uh, RFC workforce, Jones said that they borrowed bank, bank of, junior bank officers from all over the country, and, and, but the directors of the RFC always passed each application. The following year, 1934, only 64 commercial banks failed. In 1935, only 32. Um, <clears throat> Roosevelt had halted the hemorrhaging of the system. However, Let's look at the physical economy side of things because in early 1933, Roosevelt did need to get credit into the physical economies. But again, this Morgan, Mellon, DuPont, Wall Street banking crown blocked in every way. The banks were acting to, 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 to force the productive economy to collapse and to loot the government bond reserves. Despite the fact that bank assets and bank deposits increased after 1933, because of the influence of the RFC, banks changed their asset loan uh, location dramatically and allocation, so the asset allocation dramatically during these recovery years. Prior to the depression, prior to the depression, uh, banks made primarily loans and purchased some securities. During the recovery year, during the recovery years, the banks primarily purchased securities to protect themselves, stop giving out um, loans, again, just like Ben Shifley had reported in 1933 dissenting report. And nothing's changed today. <laughs> With the recent debacle on the JobKeeper package, right, the private banks, which were getting billions of dollars of support from the government, have had to be publicly admonished by jo jo Josh Frydenberg to support businesses. And this forced Anna Bly to come out and say that the banks had just set up a hotline so that businesses needing to get finance before the JobKeeper package is paid out should approach their banks and get it sorted. But it still takes two to three weeks for the banks to be able to uh, you know, approve temporary loans for this JobKeeper package. So that, look, the bankers aren't interested in anything to do with rebuilding the economy. And that's an important thing to remember. We're talking about the function of the clean energy you know, finance corporation. We are not beholden to private banking system. So this is where to get the credit of the economy, the reconstruction finance corporation was used. Now, using the reconstruction finance corporation and some other government agents, he was able to direct cheap and abundant credit in the economy and effect, effectively functioned as a bank. By the late 1930s, the RFC became the single largest investor in economic projects in the United States and the biggest bank in terms of volume of lending in the United States. Congress did not have to approve each of the RFC's important projects, given its self-supporting nature outside the federal budget process. Now, between 1932 and 1945, the RFC loaned, spent, invested, and gave away some $35 billion, which was seven and a half times the entire U.S.'s 1932 budget. And only a small part of this actually came from the initial capitalization of the $500 million. According to Jesse Jones, the RFC borrowed actually $51.3 billion from the U.S. Treasury by way of bonds and borrowed another $3.1 billion from the public. So these loans did not cost the government a penny but actually turned a profit of $690 million to the Treasury. But what it did have the effect of was it continued to stabilise the banking system. And I'm going to go through each of these elements. It saved farmers. It provided credit to business. It gave loans for disaster areas, saved homeowners from eviction, protected mortgage uh, givers. It, it invested capital for two import-export banks to finance international trade. It made loans to federal government agencies, which is by far the biggest part of it, for the Public Works Administration of building a large-scale infrastructure and the Public Works Administration and the Works Progress Administration, which put a lot of people to work uh, and in, in local, uh, in local uh, you know, county, state projects like building tunnels, bridges, dams, and so forth. And then it also expanded its activities to fund World War II. 
So I'll quickly go through each of these elements, particularly starting with support for farmers. Jesse Jones was made chairman of the RFC in June 1933, and from uh, 1940 he became the United States Secretary for Commerce in the uh, Roosevelt administration. Right. On an afternoon in 1933, Jones was called to the White House and Roosevelt said to him, Jess, I want you to lend 10, pound, 10 cents a pound on cotton to the farmers. Cotton was selling at around 9 cents per pound. Now, the RFC law said that they could only lend on, quote, full and adequate security. Therefore, this proposition was not easy, not lawful, uh, not lawfully easy. At this point, the RFC decided to set up the Commodity Credit Corporation, the Triple C, and have the RFC provide the money to, uh, to, to, to money to, to allow it to provide loans. The RFC found some three million dollars, which the Congress had authorized the president to use in the age of, uh, aid of agriculture. Eventually, over time, this was extended to one billion dollars. And if it was not for the billions of dollars of federal monies loaned to farmers to enable them to sell their crops to the CEC in an orderly manner rather than rush them to distressed markets at harvest time, the whole agricultural would have, economy would have collapsed like it nearly did in 1932. The Triple C, Commodity Credit Corporation, carried a large paper loss on the Farm Aid Program with huge stockpiles of cotton, wheat and many other commodities. All of these were eventually disposed of at a profit to both the farmer and the government. At one point, of supporting the farmers, at one point the, the job of supporting the farmers was so great that the Triple C ran out of money at a crucial time when wheat and corn farmers required financial support. Jesse Jones suggested the RFC buy $150 million worth of co cotton farmer notes to give the Triple C the money to pay the wheat farmers. The General Legal Council said he couldn't do it. But Jones asked the council what would be the penalty if we did it anyway. He said that Jones could be fired. And Jones asked, well, was that the only penalty? To which he was assured, yes, it was. So Jones went ahead and did it anyway. They had the RFC purchase the cotton notes and release 150 million whereby the, the uh, corn and wheat farmers were paid. Later, um, Roosevelt went and backed up Jones and uh, effectively got the Triple C lending fund increased to a billion dollars. And these are the industries that the Commodity Corporation uh, actually lent into, you know, cotton, corn, wheat, dairy and butter, naval stores, which are products derived from pine resin, things like turpentine and resin, tobacco, prunes in California, googlers, which are turkey growers, peanuts in seven southern states, pecans in Georgia, hops in Washington states, raisin grapes, wine grape growers, wool and mohair across the United States, and actually fire water, because when uh, there was too many grapes, uh, the RFC, or the, the, C, the CCC actually sponsored the uh, distilleries to make brandy from the excess wine grapes, but unfortunately Henry Wallace, the Secretary of Agriculture, was a teetotaler, and he requested that operation be shut down. But apparently the, um, the profits from the uh, distillation of the brandy were quite smooth, according to Jesse Jones. <clears throat> so that was the support for the farmers. Another aspect of support was the support for business. In 1934, Congress gave the Royal Finance Corporation the ability to give loans to business and industry. This was not originally allowed in the original RFC law. Over the next four years, from 1934 to 38, the RFC made 9,000 loans worth half a billion dollars, $500 million. Most of this money, importantly, went to little businessmen. More than one third of the loans were for $5,000 or less. Well, over half were for $10,000 or less, and loans of $50,000 or more were only about 17% of the entire number that were issued. The RFC tried to get local hometown banks involved as the RFC had a mandate only to loan to business if the local banks refused loans. At one point, Jones sent a letter to every one of the 14,000 banks in the US asking for their cooperation. Only 140 or 1% acknowledged the receipt of their letter. Incredibly, over half of those 14,000 banks had received RFC support. Again, this is what the private banks do. 
Many of our loans, as Jones said, were made to keep people at work when millions were work, walking the street. The typical types of business loans to support it were things like the department chain stores in multiple states. Um, the, one of the you know, worsted woolen um, mills that made yarn to make fabric. One particular one, a botany worsted mill, it would employ 5,000 people, which the RFC kept going. Postal mergers between a postal service and Western Union. It funded the first underground garages in San Francisco. It funded temporary yards and operations, paper mills. It uh, it it loaned, um, uh, it made a loan to a, uh, a a crippled person who was a student of the University of Cal California to buy a house and to continue to experiment on a thousand white mice. And the reason was that this student had been working on an anti-influenza serum in which the Navy had become in, in, interested. This was all paid back. Loans as small as $500 were issued. For example, Ed Sanders of Pasadena, California, he took people off the unemployment lines to help uh, cut down trees for people to do odd jobs. He started in July of 1936. Um, by December, he had 11 members working for him. By 1939, he had 39 members working for him. In 1938, the RFC made a loan of 30000 to the boxer, Jack Dempsey. Some of you might remember him. And that was just to refurbish his restaurant near Madison Square Gardens. Again, that loan was repaid. Jones said that during his 13 years with the RFC, from 1932 to 1945, we authorised more than 22,000 small and industrial loans aggregating $2.65 billion dollars. 10,300 of them were between $500 and $10,000, and $9,400 ranged between $10,000 and $9,400 ranged between $10,000 and $100,000. Prior to the war in 1939, the RFC, because that that figure I just gave you, those figures I just gave you, right, right, right the way through to the end of the war. Prior to the war in 1939, the RFC made just over 12,000 loans for 848.4 million mainly to the little businesses. And, and during the war, the RFC advanced another 2 million, again, mainly to small concerns. So that gives you a sense of the intention and the, the, the mode of operation of the Rural Finance Corporation for small business. Again, think about our, our mandate for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, even for small business in our country today. Support for disasters. Uh, you remember that you consider the devastation here of the recent bushfires in Australia and the utter devastation, right? And the RFC provides a model here as well. According to Jones, among the good works of the RFC were 24,900 loans to sufferers from catastrophes variously attributed to providence, nature, and man's carelessness. Floods, droughts, freezes, hurricanes, explosions, and storms came in all sizes and all manner of places. So did the monetary responses, responses come from the RFC's Disaster Loan Corporation. To one mule farmer in the deep, deep south, male and female, white and black, who just needed a little money to tide them over a, a severe dry spell, we made individual loans as low as $15. To the Mandeville Island Farms Incorporated of Stockton, California, we advanced just over a quarter of a million dollars. During one of the overflows of the Ohio River in a small Kentucky barber, in a small town uh, in Kentucky, a barber whose chair and combs, soap and shears, razors and strop had all been washed away, he reckoned he could uh, set up a, a business again if he could get a hold of $20. We loaned it to him. A flooded out Tennessee blacksmith was contented with $27 to buy a new anvil. So that must have been some flood that washed away his amble. As part of the aftermath of the Ohio flood in 1937, we advanced uh, 350,000 to the Gallatin County uh, Housing Authority for the purpose of moving the entire community of Shawnee Town, Illinois, out of the River Valley to the safe high ground. When the ruinous waters receded in uh, Paducah, Kentucky, we borrow, they borrowed $300,000 to build a hospital. This was the second largest disaster loan, but there were many others just as big. 
Most of the loans were scattered throughout 32 states were in sizes well in between of the extremes just mentioned. Over the 14 year period from 1933 to 1947, the average figure was just about $2,000. So then we move into saving the home, saving homeowners from eviction. In 1933, 40% of the nation's mortgages were in default and thousands of homeowners were foreclosed upon each week and thrown out of their homes. Mortgage lending institutions were becoming bankrupt. So the RFC had to step in to support both the mortgage lenders and the homeowners. To support the homeowners and prevent millions more people being thrown out in the street, the RFC created and owned the, and owned the Homeowners Loan and Loan Corporation and, it, uh, and, and, and started that in June of 1933. The RFC used $200 million to produce to purchase all of the homeowners and loan corporations' initial capital stock. And the HOLC was then allowed to issue up to $2 billion in bonds, which it could lend. The amounts increased in subsequent years. The Homeowners and Loan Corporation traded its bonds for shaky home mortgages and issued cash advantages to help homeowners pay tax, their taxes and make repairs. In this way, it prevented millions of homeowners from being foreclosed on and evicted. When the corporation opened for business in Akron, Ohio, a double column of homeowners stretched for three blocks down Main Street by 7 a.m. When it ceased operations in 36, the HOLC, using RFC-backed bonds to raise capital, had lent more than $3 billion to refinance mortgages, a 15-fold multiple of its initial $200 million capital base from the RFC. The benefits were enormous. The agency had helped refinance one in five mortgaged urban private dwellings in America, and the RFC repeated this process in the farm sector to prevent massive foreclosures of family farms. Here it created the Federal Farm Mortgage Corporation and bought all of the FFMC's stock. By 1936, the FFMC had refinanced more than 20% of all farm mortgages in the country, preventing loss of American farms for closure. To protect the mortgage holders in 1934, the National Housing Act was passed and it provided for the establishment of the Federal Housing Administration, which would ensure mortgage lenders against loss and the FH, and therefore the FHA, uh, required smaller percentage down payment, uh, making it easier to purchase a home. And then in 1935, the RFC mortgage company was established to buy and sell uh, uh, FHA-insured mortgages. More financial institutions um, were very reluctant to purchase FHA mortgages uh, at the time, so in 1938, the president requested the RFC establish a National Mortgage Association, the Federal National Mortgage Association, or Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae was originally funded by the RFC to create a market for these uh, FHA mortgages and later veteran uh, administration mortgages. The RFC mortgage company was absorbed by the RFC in 1947, and when it closed, the RFC closed, RF, the RFC closed, its remaining mortgage assets were transferred to Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae involved eventually into a private corporation. But during its existence, the RFC provided $1.8 billion in loans and capital to its mortgage subsidiaries. It also created, besides looking after the mortgage and the mortgagees and the rental and the, and, the, and the house purchases, it was in, concerned with international trade. So the RFC created the what's called the Export Import Bank. Now, this was an initiative by Roosevelt because he sought to encourage trade with the Soviet Union, a country in which previous presidents of Wilson, um, Harding, Coolidge and Hoover, Hoover refused to recognise. Uh, the Soviet Union needed many of the raw materials and manufactured goods which were actually in surplus in the United States. In July of 1933, before Washington actually recognised uh, Moscow, the RFC, with Roosevelt's approval, successfully financed a one-year $4 million loan to the Amtor Trading Corporation, which was an American company owned by the Soviet Union, and it was to, it bought uh, 60,000 bales of American cotton. Shortly after that, Roosevelt wanted to promote his trade more, and the Import-Export Bank was established in 1934. 
The RFC provided the capital and later loans to this bank. Interest in loans to support the support trade was so strong that a second Export-Import Bank was created to fund trade with other foreign nations a month after the first bank was created. And these two banks were merged in 1936 with the authority to make loans to encourage exports in general. And the RFC provided $201 million of capital and loans to the Export-Import Banks. So this is a pretty wide-ranging function of the RFC. But the most powerful aspect of the, and where most of the money went to, was in dealing with the uh, situation of unemployment and the collapse of the physical economy in infrastructure and so forth. And you know, this is where we get to the public works employment section. Roosevelt stressed putting people to work was his top priority in his March 4, 1933 inaugural address, as you heard. And he mobilized the American people behind this in that address to a national mission. Unemployment had risen to 12.83 million people, or 24.9% of the labour force, by 19, January 1933. On June the 6th, 1933, President Roosevelt signed into law the National Industrial Recovery Act, which established the Public Works Administration, which was an agency through which the US government would hire unemployed workers in large-scale federal um, public works <coughs> Uh, programs building everything from ports and flood control to Brisbane uh, bridges and transportation. The, this act authorized the initial spending within two years of $3.3 billion, that's $70 billion by today's standard, nearly 30% of the US federal budget expenditures for public works. This was the largest amount to be spent on public works in the nation's history, and it was all funded by the RFC. Approaching a very cold northern winter with huge unemployment in, 19, in November 1933, a second emergency public works organisation was created, directed by a gentleman by the name of Harry Hopkins called the Civil Works Administration. The Civil Works Administration was a short-lived US job creation program established to rapid, rapidly create manual labour jobs for millions of unemployed workers. Now, the CWA began its operation on November the 9th, 1933. Ten days later, Hopkins was employing 800,000 people on CWA pro payrolls. Two weeks after that, the CWA employed nearly 2 million people. Nine weeks later, in the week ending January the 18th, 1934, after the CWA had started, the CWA had a peak employment of 4.26 million men and women. The CWA's workers laid 12 million feet of silver pipe and built or improved 255,000 miles of roads, 40,000 schools, 3,700 playgrounds and nearly 1,000 airports, not to mention the uh, 250,000 outhouses still badly needed in rural America. The third public works agency that was funded by the RFC under this act was the Civilian Conservation Corps, which mainly hired youth. From 1933 to 1942, the Triple C enrollees planted nearly 3 billion trees to help reforest America, constructed trails, lodges and relevant uh, related uh, facility in more than 800 parks nationwide and upgraded most state parks, updated forest firefighting methods and built a network of, of uh, service buildings and public railroads in remote areas. The National Industrial Recovery Act created the National Public Works Administration, as I said, uh, which was originally called the Federal Emergency Administration Public Works, but was changed to the name Public Works Administration in 1935. It was eventually shut down in 1934. It also built very large projects associated with Roosevelt's idea of the four pillars uh, infrastructure development project of course, as well as many small projects, which you'll go to in a minute. The Depression, while imposing great hardship, also presented an opportunity to transmit new technology through new infrastructure projects, which were urgently needed in any, uh, in any case, and several of which had waited decades as just mere ideas in the mind of patriots and engineers. The new idea, uh, the new idea, the, sorry, the new deal of Roosevelt, which is what it was called, constructed economic infrastructure on the basis of three interrelated, 
integral objectives. Firstly, uh, Roosevelt built some of the largest projects of integrated hydroelectric power and water management in the nation's history. The centerpiece was the Tennessee Valley Authority, which revolutionized an entire economically um, backward region of Amer in America's former Confederacy. With the TVA and other great hydroelectric projects serving as national structural pillars, uh, Roosevelt filled in the rest of the expanse of the country with over 45,000 projects in the five basic categories of infrastructure over the period of 1933 to 1939. It is the water, power, health, education and transportation. Second, this infrastructure program employed millions of workers productively enabling them to restore the, the labour power um, and, the, and provide for their families. And third, uh, these infrastructure public works stimulated the economy through the multiplier of the bills of materials ordered. Each project variously required structural steel, bars, you know, cement tiles, cranes, earth moving equipment, machine tools, etc. And factories were reopened to produce the goods to fill these orders. And they in turn rehired workers in a vast proportion uh, of the economy that the Depression has shut down. So you can see, if I go back here, here's the four pillars. You have um, the Tennessee Valley Authority here. You have the Hoover Dam and Colorado River project there, the Grand Coulee Dam and the Combarooja River project here. And then you've got the St. Lawrence uh, Power and Seaway project. This one wasn't built during Roosevelt's period, but was built in the 1950s. This, this is why we say in between this, you had 45,000 other projects built as part of the, um, the, the, the the Four Pillars program. So if you have a look at the Tennessee Valley Authority, what, LaRouche, what President Roosevelt was confronted with in launching the TVA, and the reason he launched it was tremendous underdevelopment. And there were two principal reasons for this. First, nature, that is the river itself and the pattern of rainfall, and second, the presence of the ruinous confederacy in that part of the um, uh, of the country. The river itself, this map shows the uh, path transfer, transversed by the Tennessee River. It covers a water a valley watershed of some 41,000 square miles, which is half the size of Victoria. It covers all or portions of seven states, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Kentucky. The average rainfall in this Tennessee Valley is 52 inches per year, considerably higher than the national average. And in some portions of the valley, the average rainfall exceeds 80 inches per year. So destructive flooding, flooding regularly strips the topsoil from the land, robbing of its nutrients. There were exactly 45 million acres of fertile soil in the valley, but the flooding limited the agriculture to just 1.5 million. So 4.5 million acres down to a usable 1.5 million acres, and that could be farmed only sporadically. Industry could not develop in the region, and periodically the floods would submerge and destroy parts of cities such as Chattanooga, um, Tennessee. Okay. Uh, so here you have, the. this is the picture of uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1867, after the flooding of the Tennessee River inundated, inundated the entire city. At the right, you can see um, complete, with completed reservoirs and a broad well bank Tennessee River flowing past the de developed city untouched by floods. That's what they put into place. Now, the second raving uh, influence in this area was the continuing legacy of the pro feudal Confederacy. It created, 70, it, it, it created 70 years of enforced backwardness following the Civil War. Republican, a Republican Thaddeus Stevens had led the attempt to carry out reconstruction after the war to reindustrialize the South, but the Confederacy and its instruments and the instruments it spawned, like the Ku Klux Klan, mobilized to stop this. Thanks to the Confederate legacy, in 1925 the infection rate for malaria was between 30 and 40 percent in sections of the valley, and there are other diseases like smallpox and typhoid. Many sections had little sanitation and no hospitals and some and in some the rates of adult literacy were up to 50 percent 
electricity had not reached many proportions of the region. In Tennessee, only 3% of farmers had it, and in Mississippi, only 1% of farmers had electricity. All in all, there was an enforced underdevelopment. In fact, an individual walking into some parts of Tennessee could just, have been, just as well have been walking to sections of Europe during the Middle Ages. Roosevelt moved to take down the Confederate influence and eradicate underdevelopment. In 1933, there was little power generated in the region, but by 1939, six years later, the TVA system produced 2 billion kilowatts hours of electricity. By 1945, it generated nearly 12 billion kilowatts, a further sixfold increase. Today, it generates 166 billion kilowatts of power annually. Now, it should be noted that the enemies of the New Deal did everything they could to try and wreck the TVA. The Morgan Run CNS Electric Company and the Morgan Mellon DuPont controlled American Liberty League bought 57 different lawsuits against the authority to try and stop its work. In July, January of 1938, the anti-New Deal US Supreme Court, after dragging its feet for years, finally ruled on one of the precedent cases uh, which brought uh, brought against the TVA, finding, finding that the TVA was constitutional. There are, therefore, work went forward on an accelerated basis. The TVA incorporated as an integrated package hydroelectricity generation, flood control, irrigation, scientific agriculture, the fostering of manification, eradication of disease, elimination of illiteracy, the spread of electrification to bring about a revolutionary change to the region. The authority put an end to flooding and the attendant destruction. And as you can see from the photo, it shows a dramatic change for one of the region's cities. The TVA also spread electricity. In 1933, the average Tennessee Valley registered, uh, resident used per capita only 60% as much electricity as the average resident of the United States. But by 1939, the valley had leapfrogged the country and the average Tennessee Valley resident had 125% of the national average of electricity use per capita. This miraculous change altered every feature of life. The TVA also lowered the price of electricity. In 1933, the average cost of a kilowatt hour delivered electricity was a little over seven cents. By 1935, it was 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Given that ours is 40 cents, what do you reckon, guys? A saving of 65%. The TVI, uh, this, think, I'm thinking as I'm talking and, and, and giving you this address, I'm thinking about what does this mean for Hell's Gate Dam? What other things are we, you know, that we know are going to develop as a result of this, the, the building of that dam in that area for the Bradfield scheme? And think of the Bradfield scheme and all the added benefits that's going to bring. So the TVA fundamentally changed ag agriculture, and this is what's going to happen up there in also the Bradfield scheme. It set up 15,000 demonstration farms throughout the region. On the farms, agronomists work with the farmers to supply scientific methods that incorporated increased furniture, f f fertilizer use, much of which was produced by the TVA itself and sold at inexpensive prices, increased electricity use, which enabled farmers to use all manner of farm implements, the use of tiering on mountainsides to lessen water runoff, loss of topsoil, etc. And between 1933 and 1943, the per yield acre on the 15,000 TVA demonstration farms tripled. So that's just one project. The second project was the Colorado River and the Hoover Dam, which was in the bottom uh, bottom corner of the United States. The Colorado River, which starts in the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming and Colorado and runs southward through Arizona and draining an immense watershed of 250,000 square miles, including the seven, uh, including areas in seven states. Now three times. That's three times the size of Victoria or nearly the size of New South Wales. The construction of the dam started in mid-1931 under the Hoover administration, but not accelerate until Roosevelt administration took charge. The project chose its dam site, the Black Canyon near Las Vegas, Nevada. The site was a gorge with a very steep, steep drop. Daily temperatures there could reach above 100 degrees. Since the dam site was in an isolated barren area, Everything necessary had to be moved in and or constructed there. Machine shops, air compressors, two huge concrete mixing plants, warehouses, housing townships for the workers, etc. 
to, pro to provide the area with power, a 220 mile long power line had to be strung across blazing, from the blazing desert from San Bernardino, California. The dam site to be constructed started 800 feet below the upper rim of a canyon and a good deal of was unreachable by normal means. And you can see from the photo, you know, what that, how, how high that, that was. Uh, this presented a huge engineering challenge. Aerial cableways spanning the canyon were constructed, as you can see in the photo, and critical elements were lowered into the canyon. An entire modern city was built for the workers to come into the area, according to one history, in broken down cars and some walks, some were unnecessary, uh, sorry, some were unnourished as they came to the, to the towns. Upon completion, the 726 foot structure the world's highest dam by about 300 feet at that time incorporated many technological innovations, including original twin diversion tunnels. The U-shaped power plant at Hoover Dam initially generated 1.33 million kilowatts uh, of power. The uh, Hoover Dam directed the once wild Colorado, Colorado River after capturing electric, uh, its hydroelectric power to travel in an orderly fashion through the All-American Canal constructed at the time to the Imperial Valley, Valley in Southern California. This formerly the desert area receiving the water became the nation's largest vegetable growing region. The Hoover Dam, though a specifically built, through a specifically built canal and pump system, also directed the uh, Colorado River to provide much of the fresh water to the city of Los Angeles. Now together, the dam's generation of abundant power and provision of fresh water made the desert bloom and spawned industrial growth, population growth, and city building in the far west, in the southwest, far west quadrant of America, much of which had been once uh, uninhabitable. So then we move to the third pillar, which is the Grand Coulee Dam in the northwest quadrant, um, which is one of the projects. Um, the Columbia River was one of the greatest volume has one of the greatest volumes of water per second flow per second of any river in the world its headwaters arise in the bridge in british columbia columbia in canada and then heading southward the river flows into the american states of washington oregon idaho and montana and you can see the map there the columbia river watershed covers an immense 20 220,000 square miles of territory uh, in the American Northwest and an additional 39,000 square miles in Western Canada. Periodically, the river would overflow, creating deluges, while a large section of the, uh, while a large uh, section of the Northwest fertile soil could not be developed for, for lack of uh, irrigation. A chain of hydroelectric uh, and river diversion dams were built on the uh, Colorado River and its tributaries of which the crown jewels are the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State and the Bonville Dam in Oregon. Each dam itself represents a technological wonder. The Grand Coulee Dam is 530 feet high and 4,170 feet long. Um, I think that's over a kilometre, a kilometre and a half, and it contains 1.5 million cubic yards of concrete. I haven't got the metric figures for that, making it the world's largest concrete structure. Uh, outside the Three Gorges Dam in China. <clears throat> Due to its uh, huge generator, it's the world's largest hydroelectric plant built up uh, until the 1980s when you had a large dam in Brazil overtake it. The efficiency of the Grand Coulee's uh, and Bonville's hydroelectricity effectively pushed the price of electricity down to two cents per kilowatt hour delivered. And during World War II, this abundant cheap electricity led Alcoa and Kaiser Aluminium to open up aluminium plants throughout the Columbia River Basin and a Boeing company to build its major aircraft factories in Washington State. The Columbia River-based giant infrastructure project built a tremendous potential for growth still largely to be tapped uh, into a, the vast region. The fertile soil now irrigated with water from the Columbia River, River has blossomed. Now, finally, the fourth pillar of infrastructure was the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, which runs northeastward between the United States and Canada and is an outlet for the Great Lakes. 
uh, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean with potential for hydroelectric power all the way. Now, uh, Roosevelt worked on trying to realise uh, the power, the hydroelectric power um, from 1911 when he was the New York State, when he was a New York State Senator, um, but lacking a treaty with Canada, which was required for the development of the project, Roosevelt could not build it during his lifetime, but it was consummated in the 1950s and Roosevelt's uh, dream and promise had, uh, had come to light. And all these four projects transformed immense regions in the first three of these during the 1930s and 1940s and had a massive and remarkable effect on increasing productivity for the United States uh, as a unit area. Now, also, there were, as I said before, there was tons of well, 45,000 other projects all by the public, built by the Public Works Administration for Public Works employment. Dams and hydro projects. Built, Roosevelt built 43 other major dams and hydroelectric projects in 22 states. He also built over 450 medium and smaller size dams. Power plants. Roosevelt built 250 power plants for local governments. The rural electrification of the rural countryside. In 1934, some 49.2 million rural Americans did not have use of electricity. That was 89% of those who were living in rural areas, and 39% of all Americans were without electric power. Roosevelt produced a great increase in capacity, but the question was how to get the power to rural America. So in 1935-36, he created the Rural Electrification Administration to electrify the countryside. The REA set up and extended loans to rural cooperatives to purchase electricity and build transmission lines. By the mid-1970s, the REA program included, this is the 1970s, the REA program included 1.8 million miles of power line, power transmission lines, 50% of the nation's total. Uh, figure one shows that, and this figure on the screen, shows that in 1933, only one in 10 American farmers had electricity. This rose to 48% in 1945 and then 88% by 1955. The, as the REA and New Deal projects came online, the productive potential of rural communities was elevated. Then you look at some less sexy things like sewage disposal projects. More than, in 1933, more than 40% of America's urban population did not have sewage treatment. This map shows the construction of over a thousand sewage treatments throughout the United States. Between 1934 and 1938, the New Deal constructed more sewage treatment plants in New York State than had been built there in the previous 30 years. In hospital systems, in 1930s in Florida, between 500 and 1,000 people died every year from tuberculosis, yet the state did not have a single hospital dedicated to tuberculosis treatment and cure. In sections of the South, hospital treatment was primitive. In 1937, Roosevelt mobilised to conquer the problem uh, with what's called indicative planning. He set up the Interdepartmental Committee to coordinate health and welfare activities. A technical com committee of this broader committee was created, which made a survey of the nation's health needs. In 1938, Roosevelt called a national conference at which the technical committee committee's presentings were, were presented. It found that 40% of the counties in the United States did not have a single registered general hospital, that 60% of the states had fewer hospitals than could be considered adequate, and there was an acute shortage of pure drinking water and sanitary sewage systems. The president's approach was to build hospitals to an indicative level of population, indicative level per thousands of population between 1939 and 1930, and 1933 and 1939, the New Deal affected uh, an increase of 121,760 hospital beds nationwide. That's in six years. So per population, per percent of population, it was you know, massively increased. Public Works Authority produced uh, many thousands of projects for fresh water projects, as you can see here in uh, the uh, in the map. In transportation, the Roosevelt, the Roosevelt um, 
Roosevelt uh, constructed every fundamental form of transportation from tunnels, bridges and rail to ports and uh, waterways. And the Public Work Administration lent money to the Pennsylvania Railroad, America's largest eastern railroad, to carry out uh, electrification projects. It, it was allowed to build 68 electric locomotives and buy another 33 locomotives and 93,787 uh, 93, tonnes of rail. The Public Works Associ uh, Administration also built the Chicago Loop Elevated Subway and the New Deal allotted funds primarily to the Army Corps of Engineers to widen, deepen or improve almost every major harbour on the east, south and west coasts of the United States. In education, Roosevelt's school construction between 1933 and 1939, the New Deal accounted for more than 70% of all school construction nationwide, building 60,000 classrooms with seats for approximately 2.5 million uh, children. So you can see under Roosevelt and with uh, his prodding, he's pushed a lot of these programs himself, the RFC provided capital for the important public agencies whose uh, you know, whose activities raised from preventing home foreclosures to providing funds for public works, employment and infrastructure down to local sewers in every single council and county area. But that, he wasn't finished. I mean, that was what he did to deal with the process of having to cope with the war. But then you had the, the economic mobilisation for the war and uh, this is where the RFC basically built the United States up to be an arsenal for democracy, as Roosevelt used to call it. And he wanted to mobilise, FDR wanted to mobilise the US for war very early when it first broke out in 1939, but he had major obstacles to overcome. Um, there, were, there was a lot of political, uh, there was as much political opposition as there was economic. Firstly, the economy was not functioning up to speed. It had just basically been waking up from the Depression. And secondly, the opposition to the US entry into the war that early against Hitler was frowned upon. And also you had a non-existent US military. Now, the first obstacles arose from the fact that their Wall Street and, and uh, Norman Montague had set back the economy in 1937 and it still needed technological improvement. Despite everything that happened, with all these great projects, there was a backlash and the bankers came back in and they stopped the continued development. So when the war broke out, the economy had actually slipped backwards. The other opposition came, uh, there was actually outright opposition to any build-up came from um, a, various, a coalition of various intentioned individuals. There was widespread fear of war and the pro-Nazi faction grouped around the Harriman Banking House and such visual, uh, individuals as John Foster Dallas. They didn't want to go to war against uh, Hitler because they were actually sympathisers. And, you know, the fear was manipulated by this faction throughout the widespread isolationist movement saying the United States should go it alone, don't get involved. In 1940, FDR asked, FDR asked Congress for funds to construct 50,000 planes, but Congress would only approve funds for 57. In November, of 90, uh, in, in November of 1941, one month before Pearl Harbor, a majority of businessmen polled by Fortune magazine opposed the essential efforts to convert US industry to war production, denouncing that effort as a propaganda trick by FDR to impose a more radical phases of the New Deal. And thirdly, as I said, the lack of an actual US military. The US, the United States was unprepared to fight. Within the armed forces, there was widespread belief up until the moment the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, that the United States would send planes and, and munitions to Europe and the Far East, but would never send its own fighting forces. Instead, it would sit back and defend the coastal region of the United States if and when Hitler attacked. Douglas MacArthur, George Marshall and Dwight Eisenhower rigorously attacked this belief. The Nazis had a military air force of approximately 40,000 planes in uh, coming into the war, eight times that of the United States. And while the United States could only produce 2,000 planes a year, Goering had a capacity to manufacture 18,000. In 1940, the Nazis had 10,500 motorized tanks, 
in 20 motorised divisions, 135,000 trucks and 60,000 motorcycles. The United States had 500 tanks and we don't know what the rest of the, we don't know what else they had, not very much. The Nazis had a battle-tested efficient army of 7 million. The US had 370,000 soldiers and armed and another 170,000 reserves. In 1940, the supplies in the US arsenals were so low that the new create, newly created citizens' army had to train with wooden guns and soldiers fired field pieces which had stopped stove pipes for barrels. Almost anything on four wheels served as a tank in war games and half of the army's one million pounds of gunpowder was, gun was actually World War I surplus. So once Roosevelt, finally after Pearl Harbor, assumed the role of wartime commander-in-chief, he implemented the principles of the American system of political economy that guided the New Deal, but with a new characteristic emphasis. Firstly, Franklin Roosevelt conducted a crash effect, uh, a crash economic effort, a mobilization for World War II. With the help of the RFC, eight new subsidiaries were established. The Rubber Reserve Company, the Defence Plant Corporation, Defence Supplies Corporation, the War Damage Corporation, the US Commercial Company, Rubber Development Corporation, and the Petroleum Reserve Corporation, which later became the War Assets Corporation. This crash took the achievements of the New Deal and push the economy into non-linear growth that seems beyond the scope of what the ordinary person would have achieved or believed achievable. He used the method of Hamilton. Hamilton. He directed cheap and abundant credit from the RF, RFC for the productive economy, for the constructive infrastructure and so forth needed for the war. But it was distinguished from the New Deal in that it was very much premised and explicitly driven by the idea of developing a scientific and a scientifically uh, a scientific driver within a machine tool design sector, and it was a you know, this was this was a qualitatively different solution. The again, as I said, the abundant cheap credit was injected into the economy through the Rural Construction Finance Corporation and through the U.S. Federal Reserve Board lending window, but only for top priority product the latter for the only for top priority productive sectors. These productive sectors where manufacturing, construction, mining, power generation, transportation, and to a more limited degree, agriculture. Other sectors of the economy got limited credit, but speculation, rentier finance, the secondary real estate market, and like, was suppressed and cut off from all credit. Teams of the best scientists and uh, engineers were assembled to make planned scientific breakthroughs. And the Manhattan Project is the best known for the, uh, and the most breathtaking World War II example. Under this program, within two years, $3 billion was spent, 22,000 scientists and engineers were assembled, including such scientists as Enrico Fermi and uh, Ernest Lawrence, as well as Colonel Leslie Groves and the Army Corps of Engineers to harness the process of the atom discovered by Mary Curie and her heirs and to produce a controlled reaction from uranium-235. In this way, Seminal ideas about the physical universe were forced into existence and fleshed out, permanently altering man, nature and man's lives. Electricity was used in a scale not attempted before, including doubling the electric horsepower funnel into manufacturing between 1939 and 1945. Electricity was only fully exploited during World War II. Projects such as the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Grand Coulee Dam, which were developed by Roosevelt during the 30s, supplied massive amounts of electricity necessary to exploit for the first time a highly electricity intensive aluminium industry without which the United States may not have won the war. The changes within the economy with the use of power and technology were profound. Industrial growth output between 1939 and 1944, the index measuring real goods uh, output of the economy more than doubled and the average annual compounded growth rate was 16.9.9%. In terms of lifting wages, wages more than doubled between 1939 and 1944, and corporate profits increased four and a half times. This demonstrates that both corporate profits and wages can grow at the same time because of the increase of the surplus production and the leaps in productivity 
uh, vastly increased the size of the surplus and profits which came, uh, which could be shared through wages. The transformation of the labour force. In 1939, the official number of unemployed at nine, was 9.5 million, was almost as large as the total number of manufacturing workforce at 10.3 million. By 1944, the unemployment level had fallen to a mere 0.67 million. There was an acute shortage um, of labour throughout all sectors of industry, and this reject this re represented a reduction in labour or unemployment level by 8.81 million people. From 1939 to 1944, the US armed forces grew from 370,000, 370, as I mentioned before, to 11.41 million. The common but false interpretation of the war period is that the armed forces simply absorbed the unemployed. But look what happened to the manufacturing labour force. Labor force. It grew by 70% um, during the war years. Even after the war ended in 1947, the manufacturing labour force was still 15.6 million, a 50% increase over the 1939 levels. Blacks and women entered the labour force in large numbers during the war. Many women left, coloured people stayed, and upgrading of their status and living and upgrading of their sta status and living conditions. Thus, the labour force had been permanently altered along with the economy. The expansion in manufacturing is what equipped the United States to have stable growth in the 1950s. Then you look at the machine tool component, and the tra you know because machine machine tools incorporate and transmit into the economy what the, the most advanced scientific discoveries that have been made. Without them, for example, boring, cutting, polishing, vending machines, no plant and equipment could have been constructed to fight the war. In 1938, uh, the United States had 38,000, sorry, 34,000 machine tools of all kinds, but during World War II, money and invention were poured into the machine tool plant capacity, and by 1942, the, the United States was producing 307,000 machine tools, nearly 10, nearly 10 times the 1938 level and 50 times the level of 1933. These machine tools were, far, were also made far more productive. This was of critical importance, especially in producing aircraft. For example, the engine of a, white, a Wright Cyclone 14 aircraft was composed of 3,500 different parts totaling 8,500 pieces, requiring an estimated 80,000 machining operations. So in order to be able to build this, you actually had to build machines that were precise, uh, composite, and by doing so, you, you were able to effectively reduce jobs that would have taken uh, two hours plus down to a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. This increased uh, productivity was re reflected in another um, uh, fact, as this shows from another graph, which is this one. Aeroplane output, military and civilian, civilian um, output. During World War I, the aeroplane played um, uh, almost no role and travelled at a top speed of 100 miles per hour. During World War II, the aeroplane uh, played a major role, travelled at top speeds between 250 and 300 miles per hour. Such uh, revolutionary um, World War II discoveries, added, uh, such as radar, added, added to the ability, the, the ability to pr pr prosecute the war. Um, and, it, and it also changed the, um, the theory of aerodynamics. Changes in the production method of aircraft were equally startling. The already existing aircraft industry was considerably geared up above all, um, and the consumer automobile secretary, sector, which actually boomed in the 1920s, was closed down and converted to aircraft production. On January the 20th, 1942, the War Production Board ordered the cessation of all automobile production. The last passenger car came off the assembly line on February 10th, 1942. The conversion of the auto industry was more than just changing a few, uh, the order of a few assembly lines or replacing certain machine tools. The conversion meant in many cases ripping out all entire assembly lines and replacing 70 or 80% or of the machine tools and extending the size of the buildings, replacing concrete floors and so on. 
In many aspects, the aircraft industry functioned as the leading or second most important science driver for the economy, uh, depending on how one considers, considers the nuclear industry uh, as another one of these industries um, during this particular period. At, at, at its peak in 1943, the, uh, the army of air, aircraft plant employees grew to 2.1 million or 12.4% of the total national manufacturing uh, workforce. More was involved than just a sheer increase in employment. The production of an aircraft had previously been a cottage industry operation. Assembly lines weren't in use, weren't in widespread use, and almost everything was handcrafted. For example, the Rolls Royce aircraft engine, which was installed in some of the Spitfire, uh, Spitfire aircraft that the American, that the United States produced for Britain, required six months to produce by hand. To mobilise for the war effort, capital goods and raw material resources were directly allocated where necessary. The training and retraining of workers was undertaken on a scale unprecedented in American history, including training three million civilians between 1941 and 1942 alone. The elements are, um, this is what was developed during World War II, the commercial development of, mag, uh, of aluminium, the development of magnesium, synthetic rubber, development of synthetic resins, plastics and fibres, development of penicillin, the utilisation of electron microscope, radar, vacuum tube, tu tubes, the crash program of, of nuclear power, as I said, nuclear energy and the bomb, shipbuilding, uh, pre-assembled parts cut uh, production time by 90% and industrial operations, including industrial welding, which, which made up per, made things up to 200% more efficient. These elements of, uh, in their general form are what I've gone through, shows you uh, what happens when you uh, adopt the American system of political economy. The, out, the, the turnout from the economic mobilization and the, up, the increase, look at it. Air Force planes, 5,000 to 300,000. Airplane production capacity, 2,000 to 96,000 in one year. Tanks, 500 to 100,000. Troops went from 370 to 11.44 million. Ships, 124,000. Uh, leftover one, World War I gunpowder went to you know, 4.1 billion rounds. Uh, steel to 434 million tonnes. Textiles, aluminium, magnesium, and so forth. Look at the huge increase in the physical production of goods in the economy. This was necessary to crush the Nazis. Now, the US was producing tons of logistics per soldier, where the German economy was crushed and it was only producing you know, tens of pounds in the end to support the Nazi onslaught. And this was what this was totally necessary to secure the Nazi victory, uh, the victory over the Nazis, and also to secure civil civilization. The process was not a bunch of particulars, but the commitment to the economic transformation of the economy through the idea of developing the science driver uh, uh, principle. And this is exactly what LaRouche talked about in terms of developing the economy. So in summary, from 1932 to 1945, the RFC spent, loaned, and invested and gave away some $35 billion, right, as I said before. And the RFC borrowed actually $51.3 billion, but did not use it all. In the war effort, uh, in the struggle against the Depression, I should say, the RFC used approximately $10.5 billion of that without loss to the taxpayers, and it was all returned to the Treasury, Federal Treasury and lenders, and gave the government in total uh, between you know, the war effort and the uh, depression $690 million in profits. In the war effort, the corporation authorized expenditures of more than $34 billion, of which over just over 22.4 billion were dispersed. Now, interestingly, over this vast overlay, 
9.3 billion was unrecoverable, but this was foreseen. This particular, you know, 9.3 billion of the 22.4 billion spent for the war was deemed unrecoverable. But this was foreseen and was specifically authorized by the Congress as the measure of uh, the measureless process of victory for the war. After the war, Public Law 860 was approved on the 30th of June 1948 by the Congress, and it, uh, the Congress directed the Secretary of the Treasury to cancel the RFC notes given to it for the amount of 9.3 billion. See, a sovereign nation is not indebted to itself. It can determine that debt is a useful tool for the general welfare. The enormous amount was written off. You know, 9.3 was 9.3 billion out of the 22.4 billion that was dispersed to fight the war was considered the cost, the measureless price of victory for the war. And because it was issued by sovereign credit individuals, institutions, it had no cost to the economy. Because the cost, there was no cost to the economy because the economy had expanded so far in the physical economic terms that it, 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 it didn't matter what the money value was. Which is, you know, just people get so fixated about money, but in this case, the money was issued in the form of credit for a specific purpose. In other words, to fund a specific operation into the future, both to fight the depression in the early period, and then secondly to fight the war, prosecute the war in the second period. So, you had an intention to create something in the future, and that's what was done. And therefore, the money was simply an idiot slave to the intentions of the people like Roosevelt and Jesse Jones who wanted to have outcomes that benefited the people. And they, you know, the fact is that at the end of the day, it didn't cost the government a penny. It was $690 million profit made, right? Everything was returned. All the loans were paid, apart from those that were specifically already foreseen, uh, you know, foreseen by the government to be written off in the interest of the general welfare and the development of the population. The same process of writing the debts had occurred, writing down the debts had occurred 10 years earlier when the Congress authorized the Treasury to cancel 2.8 billion of the 10.5 billion in RFC notes that were used to fund the relief for the Depression. The Congress at that time organized that that be canceled because it had done its job and protected the American people. So that's the power of a truly sovereign credit system, which is owned by the government such that you don't have to fear debt. And when it's in the interest of the people, you can simply write it off. So that's what I want to give you in terms of a, uh, a sense of what the, uh, the, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation can become. Given where the RFC came from, there's every reason to believe this can not only be done, but it's absolutely necessary. Craig, uh, when you have a bank holiday, that that mean wouldn't take that long because with bank holiday, that mean there's no normal banking functioning or something. What what will happen during the bank holiday? The banks are shut. They just so don't. people can they can't. people can't do any. No, now it might be a bit different today. I mean, the bank holidays basically means. Well, no, it's the same thing today. Bank means that there's just no bank transactions. Nothing happens. It's shut down. Now, back then, of course, in the 30s and 40s, you didn't have the internet and so forth. So people had to physically go and transact things or write a check out and get that, you know, physically, um, uh, you know, cashed or, you know, whatever. All of that stopped. People, there was no banking system, right? And Roosevelt was only able to do it because of what he said in his address. See, there was that forthright and that blunt to the American people, and he called out who the bankers were, and the American people knew it, because that's why they were hoarding. They knew it. And the fact is, you know, a week after the banks opened, the, the fact was that people, even for banks that didn't get any RFC funding, were putting their money banking in the banking system, because banking is only a matter of trust. It's, that's all it is. If you lose the trust in your banking system, right, which is why the government fears the threats from the banking system half the time, if you have lose bank, trust in your banking system, you've lost everything, right? That's why the government will even do stuff that's illegal to try and make sure 
the banking system is seen to be operational when it's you know in our case here in Australia the damn things are broke they're they're, they're bankrupt but every machination of the Reserve Bank and you know the ASIC APRA is to give us the illusion that they're 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 perfectly fine they're perfectly um, well capitalized and all that sort of stuff yet National Australia Bank you know paused its trading on the uh, stock market yesterday in order to issue 3.2 billion dollars and we haven't even got to the bottom of that yet. Okay, now. You know all this miracle, this economic miracle by you know like that last figure, you know 1939 to 44 in the Air Force. Did did you know the amount of debt the U.S. government came out of Second World War? Or? The, the, the U.S. debt, the U.S. government didn't come in, didn't get into debt in the Second World War. That wasn't directed towards the war. It wasn't paid off. Um, it was the, the RFC funded the war, right? It, the, the RFC uh, effectively bought, um, you know, sold war bonds or sold uh, bonds to the Treasury, which issued the money, which is then spent into the economy. And uh, the RFC effectively loaned, in many cases, through, you know, as I said, what was it 22,000 loans um, to various businesses and so forth, small businesses? All of these were done on a commercial basis, which weren't necessarily usury, you know, you're charging 10% or 13% interest rate like they're doing overdrafts today here in Australia, they're at 2% or 1.5%. And if it was deemed necessary for the, for the, um, uh, uh, for the general welfare or for the, for the war, you know, some of that money was simply written off. So the government wasn't in, the US, the US government wasn't indebted to external forces coming out of uh, uh, out of um, uh, World War Two, it wasn't indebted to the private banking system because uh, I think Australia came with big debt after World War Two, isn't it? As despite we had like National Bank of Credit. Yeah, we had a lot of debt too, but uh, as you saw from the graph that was on the front of the alert service last week, you know that one. Hang on, over here, right? Yeah, yeah. The key is not the debt. You don't have to fear the debt. The question is, are you going to be committed to the physical economy? Are you committed to creating projects that increase the physical economic output of the economy? Are you going to grow the economy and keep people in work? You see, and this is the difference between the Mellon Coolidge era where they says, no, what is sacrosanct is we have to balance the budget. We have to make sure our budget is in surplus. And so, therefore, you don't invest in the physical economic means of producing real wealth. And you have a look today at where we sit in terms of the production of personal protective gear equipment for our frontline nursing staff. Apart from Joe Carmody, we've got next to no one that can produce this stuff on a mass scale. And even his, you know, his, his factory is being tooled up 300%. Because why? It's because the whole basis upon economics these days is, is monetarism. You've got to make money. You've got to you know, put money in the stock market. You've got to speculate on it. You've got to get into derivatives, right? This is 40 years that's built up. This cancer's built up in our economy. And what's happened with the coronavirus is it's blown up in the, the establishment's face because people say, and I've heard it time and time again, you know, why aren't we producing the basic the economic security goods that we need? And, you know, we heard this morning about the fact that, um, uh, you know, it's not just oil that is a problem, but also water. Well, I just heard a radio interview before I started on this presentation to say that there was a study done 10 years ago to say that Australia only has one one week's supply of medical uh, um, uh, medicines and so forth if the uh, international airline system shuts down. That's all we've got. So we're at risk there as well. So it's pretty stunning what's happening now. And more and more people, people are not going to tolerate anymore the, um, the, the, the period that we've been into for the last... Um, you know, 40 years, and it's our unique voice through the mobilisation for the clean energy 
Finance Corporation, whereby we can begin to re-educate members of parliament, right, that this is what our country demands, this is what the people demand, and we've got the ability to educate people through presentations like this about what what the um, uh, you know, what the historical precedents are. And I, you know, I, part of this presentation also was to go on and, and map out the Australian war mobilisation and what we produced and stuff like that. But I, of course, but that would take another hour and a half. But you, you think about uh, like the foresight of Roosevelt in getting the RFC to do small increments to small enterprises, which then constituted the capacity to be able to mobilise for the war. So it wasn't like it was one big place in one place. There was a heck of a lot of all across the country as a part of the process of expanding their the, the skills within the population. Do you realise that this government could take the $130 billion that's spent in the economy, given it to the Clean Energy Corporation, and then every single business could go to the CEC, CEFC if it was mandated this way, to get the money it would need for the next six months to trade, no matter what it was, without security. Because what will happen was people will go, people aren't going to, uh, to onto the JobKeeper allows that the government's allow, uh, government um, um, proposing because what's happened is they're losing the sovereignty of who they can employ and not employ. Of, of the 900,000 businesses that have applied, 500,000 are the ones that have continued on. So 400,000 businesses don't want to get involved in the government's JobKeeper problem. There's two reasons for that. Firstly, one business has 200 employees, a number of which are casuals or seasonal workers that have been with them for more than 12 months. But under the JobKeeper allowance, they are compelled to pay those people $550 or $750 a week for the next six months, which means they then have to go to the bank or find that money in order to be able to fund that person's employment, even when they're not actually fully employed on, on a full-time basis with that organisation. And that becomes, an, if you've got, to say, 200 employees and 50 of them are casual uh, workers that are only seasonally employed, that's an enormous impost on any business. So they, they think it's better off not to not to go down that, just put your workers off, right? So that, that's one of the traps with the JobKeeper um, program that the government's put out. Is what the government's done, again, typical, is it's privatised it's privatised the uh, government program to save businesses to businesses. In other words, businesses have to wear the process of recapitalising themselves through the JobKeeper uh, uh, program, uh, and the government can just, doesn't have to take any responsibility for that. That's what it's done. It's typical of the way that this government thinks. It's typical of a Montpellier society, society conservative, liberal, liberal, Coolidge, Mellon government. 